Are there any tools that you would recommend to family members to help their relatives recover from a mental illness or brain disorder? Let me divide the answer to this into two parts. One is kind of personal or family tools and the other one is kind of more clinical tools that you can use even if you're not a professional. From a family point of view, your strongest tool is the love you have for the person in your family. You're going to have more of that than any professional is ever going to have for your own family member. But mental illnesses can often build barriers for that love so it doesn't get across. The two most common are fear. If something's happened dangerous, if you've been held at knife point by your loved one, if you've gotten scared what's going to happen with their psychosis, you're going to not you're going to be behind that fear and being self-protective and not your love isn't going to come out as much. If you can get out of some of that fear, you can use your own to love more. The other common barrier is grief. This isn't what you imagined your family or your loved one was going to be like. This, you, they lost what they had, they also ha lost the dreams you had for them. And you're going to be captured in various kinds of grief, various parts of the process of still not willing to get to acceptance of where they're at. You're still going to be in anger and bargaining and depression and denial about what's happening. And those are going to be barriers to you being able to connect to, to your loved one. Let me give an example of this just as a person who's not a family member. Is My 15 minutes of fame was from Steve Lopez and the soloist. When he first met Nathaniel, he didn't know how do you help someone with severe mental illnesses without giving them pills and locking them up. And he came down to me for advice as someone who spent a lot of time doing this. Eventually, I it ended up part of the book. And I think if you want to see how it evolves for someone who wants to help someone, pay attention to Steve's book more than the movie because the book's more about him and the movie's more about Nathaniel. They're both good products. And Steve brings three things, tools of his own personality to to bear on it. First thing he brings is actual curiosity. He wants to know what it's like to be Nathaniel. He stops and talks to a guy under a bridge, all smelly, all messed up, who everyone else is driving by and doesn't want to see. And he really does want to know. He's curious what it's like to be him. One of your tools is your own respectful curiosity. Second thing Steve brings is he's willing to get involved. He has courage and wants to be part of it. He goes and sleeps overnight at Skid Row with Nathaniel, even though all of us told him not to do that. It was too dangerous. He's willing to get involved. Not just in kind of a distance as a newspaper one, really involved in his life and take risks. And Steve had courage. Helping someone often takes courage. And the third thing Steve had is the ability to hang in there with someone when they don't do what you say, it ends up all messed up without getting absurdly frustrated and taking it out on them and hanging in there anyway. When he gets Nathaniel in an apartment and Nathaniel says, never mind, I'm going to stay under the bridge and he's done all this work to get it, it's real easy to say, the hell with that. I'm not doing this anymore, I'm frustrated, you just do what I say, let me get some more power, some more force. It, it's what, our main tool here is our patience and our perseverance. Can we stick with someone who's not doing what we think is best, who's having bad outcomes as a result, who won't learn their lessons from what we, and what we don't have power over, and the more we try to get, the more they resist us. Do we have the patience and perseverance to stick with them alongside with them, to keep loving them, connected to them, year after year after year in, this cro in these chronic, difficult, painful conditions? So those are the three tools that go with love. It's about curiosity, about courage, and about patience and persistence. There are some clinical tools you can borrow from our fields too, and I want to share a few of these with you that you don't need any fancy degrees to use. So let me go through a couple of my favorites along the way. My first favorite is listening. This one, when when we ask you guys at NAMI or we do a survey, what would you like us professionals to learn? What skills would you like us to build on? What, you want me to go back to school? Do you want me to pay more? What do you want us to pay attention to a workshop for? Your number one answer, with like three quarters of the uh, dwarfs, everything else, is you want me to become a better listener. You all know how important being listened to is. Work on your own ability to listen. As Mark Twain put it, listening isn't just waiting for your turn to talk. Listening is making a space in your heart for their story, knowing full well it may change you to hear that story. 
Listen to not just the words, but the music behind the words. Let them control the pace of the story coming out to be able to listen to them. Work on listening, and that's a very powerful tool. Second clinical skill comes from a psychologist from last century, Carl Rogers. This is a famous psychologist over about 100 years, and his overall theory of life was that therapy wasn't something we do to someone. Therapy is we make a relationship in which that person can grow. He believed, of course, there's terrible things that deteriorate and destroy life, but there's also positive things that build up. Creativity and love and spirituality and growth and evolution, all kinds of good stuff. And our job is to create a relationship in which that is fertile so the person's natural growth inside them can come out. What do you need? Well, he said you have three things that you need to do to be able to make this come out. One is you need to actually be empathetic to get what it's like to be them. I think he would have loved my back of the hand story. Two is you need to actually be authentic of how you're feeling and not hiding behind uh, your own fear, behind professionalism, behind distance design roles. You're actually being you. And three is you have to find things you actually like and care about the person. What was that? The guy's famous for a hundred years for those three things? That's like kindergarten. What was that? What, getting... But take, think about this for a second in your own life. How many people do you actually know in your own life who really get you from the inside, who are straight with you, who are authentic, you know what they're about, and they still like and care about you? Anybody got more than five out there in the audience? I'm wagering you got less. And now think for a minute, isn't Carl right that those people are absolutely treasured to you? Isn't he right that you grow in their presence that brings out the best in you? And isn't he right that you don't have to do, they don't have to do anything besides those three things? They don't have to have fancy advice or resources or something else. Just doing those three things is enough for you to be able to grow. That's clinical skill number two. You can take Carl Rogers' three points. Next one is about hope. We've learned that you need hope to recover. There's very few hopeless people who recover. Hope is not just optimism or having a cheery disposition or something. Hope means being able to see a positive, concrete future that might happen, to believe it's possible. It doesn't mean denying the bad things. It means you can get to the future even with the bad things. I was talking to a lady once who we were been working with for a while and she'd gotten, we were taking her out to lunch because she got all A's on a set of tests at Long Beach City College. We're taking her out to celebrate. I said, well, you worked so hard and did all this stuff. She said, well, you were helpful too. I said, well, what did I do that was helpful? She said, well, I would come to your office and complain about stuff. You know, my boyfriend's no good, the pills are no good, my father's no good, the apartment's no good. Maybe you know this lady. But anyway, I would come to the office and complain about stuff. And all you would do is say stuff like, I can see you over at Long Beach City College. That army fatigues you're wearing, that funny chain and those big boots, they look really stupid in this office, but they'll fit in over there. And you're not that old, you're kind of smart, I can see you over there. I got this friend who works in a disabled student's office, he can help you with the fee waiver and stuff. She said, the more you talk about how you could see it, then I could see it too. And once I could see it, then I could do it. One of the things family members, anybody can do is help people see a positive future they actually can believe in. Because if you don't actually believe it, you're not going to do the hard work to get there. If I never met a doctor, I'd never get past two weeks of medical school. You have to see where you're going. Not to say that's where you're going to get to. You're going to get to some entirely different place than you thought. But you have to have hope to get moving. Third clinical skill and this comes from this book I'll share with you in a minute. It's called Motivational Interviewing. This comes from the substance abuse people. The substance abuse people noticed that if somebody comes and says, well, I'm thinking about getting off of drugs, and maybe I will, and you say, great, here's a program. Let me take you over and sign up. They run the other direction. And then you get all upset and frustrated. How come you don't really want to go? You were just manipulating. You're not really ready. You're not motivated. And we get all angry and punitive at them. And what they realize is that any major decision involves a lot of thinking through an ambivalence and steps to get there. And for example, the best example I know of is the decision to get married. The decision to get married 
Is it finished? The best example I know for making a big decision that goes through a lot of stages is the decision to get married. The decision to get married, first you sort of visualize, I might get married sometime, I don't know. And then you say, well, I might get married with that person. You're writing your name with his last name instead, or you go looking at houses together or something. Then it might turn into actual planning. You might actually start planning a wedding. Or you might get engaged to engaged to get married some in the future. Then you might take the action to actually get married, and then you have to sustain your marriage. There's actual stages that we go through, from pre-contemplative to contemplative to planning to action and maintenance. And if you mismatch what you're doing with the stage you're at, it'll all go wrong. Marriage is so important that we've got rituals for all these things. If you go on a first date and you say, let's get married, you're at the wrong stage and you're going to get thrown out of there on that. On the other hand, if your wife's talking, to, your potential wife is saying, let's plan the, the, the wedding now, it's going to be in June, and let's look at these invitations, and you say, I'm not so sure I really want to get married. I'm not sure. Maybe we should date around a little bit first so that I'm really sure. You're in trouble, too. You've got to match these to stage. And this stage, when you see someone with mental illness, the process of recovery, the process of coming to terms with your what's wrong with you, whether you come in terms in biological terms or other terms, the process of taking responsibility for your life, whether you use medications, whether you get off drugs, do some internal work, those 13 things we were talking about before, all of those you're going to have to go through stages of first I'm sort of thinking about it, and I'm planning, now I'm doing, now I'm maintaining. And you can learn how to help people along those stages by learning about motivational interviewing from a book like the one I showed you or something else.